So in chapter six, we learned about how cells can um, break down glucose to make energy. And chapter seven is all about the opposite. It's all about how plant cells and other uh, photosynthetic organisms are going to capture energy to make glucose or to make uh, you know starches and foods uh, that other animals can eat. So let's take a look and see how this works. Okay, so from the beginning, life on Earth has been solar powered in a sense. Um, all of the energy that is needed by organisms is harnessed uh, from the sun. And the process in which uh, organisms do this is called photosynthesis. So, interesting little note, photosynthesis produces 160 billion metric tons of carbohydrates each year. That's a lot. <laughs> and uh, the way that it you know can produce so much is that because in one square millimeter of leaf, now remember a millimeter is the tiny tiny little um, lines on our ruler, the metric ruler, that's one millimeter, okay? Um, in one square millimeter of leaf, there's 500,000 chloroplasts, okay? So imagine, you know, a whole tree worth. That's a lot of chloroplasts that can convert a lot of uh, solar energy into carbohydrates, all right, so we're going to talk about the who of photosynthesis. Who is responsible for doing photosynthesis? Well, on land, um, mosses, ferns, and flowering plants, and trees, and all those um, autotrophic organisms are going to uh, harness solar energy through photosynthesis. And also in water, we have um, you know, the large kelp beds are going to... Um, do the process of photosynthesis, as well as little microscopic organisms, um, protists called euglena, and uh, bacteria called cyanobacteria. In fact, here are a couple of pictures of euglena and cyanobacteria. The solar powerhouse of plant cells, um, which are the chloroplasts, are present in all green parts of a plant. So if the part of a plant is green, it can do photosynthesis. Um, now, the majority of them are found in leaves. The majority of chloroplasts are found in leaves. That's where they're highly concentrated. And um, within the leaf, they're going to be concentrated in what's called the mesophyll, okay, which is the green tissue in the interior of the plant. And stomata which is uh, important um, when it comes to photosynthesis, we'll find out later, um, are the little, the little tiny pores on the underside, usually, of um, the leaf. So there's the stomata on the underside, and then in the green kind of fleshy part of the leaf is what we call the mesophyll, where we've got a high concentration of chloroplasts. As we'll talk about in a couple of slides, there are two ingredients to make glucose, which is the, uh, you know, the primary monomer of all the other disaccharides and polysaccharides and starches and stuff like that that uh, plants can make. And those two ingredients are carbon dioxide and water. Now the carbon dioxide is a gas, and so that's going to enter the leaf through that stomata, those little pores we were talking about on the underside. And oxygen, we'll find out, is a byproduct of um, photosynthesis, so it is also a gas, and will leave through the stomata. So the stomata is for gas exchange. It's kind of like, you know, the leaves and the, the plant's lungs in it, essence. Now water um, is going to come from the soil that the, the plant is in, and so um, it's going to be absorbed from the soil uh, down, you know, in the roots, and it's going to travel up the stem or the trunk to the leaves via the veins of the plant. Photosynthesis takes place within the chloroplast of the plant cells. And so we're going to take a look at its microanatomy. Now the chloroplast is a double membrane structure. So the inner membrane, uh, the one you know, kind of down here that I'm tracing, is going to enclose a compartment called the stroma which is 
kind of like a thick fluid. And within that fluid, we have the thylakoid, okay, which are these um, discs, okay, these disc-like structures. And there's tons and tons of these disc-like structures within the stroma. Now these discs, these thylakoids, are concentrated, they're stacked up in what are called grana. So um, in essence, the you know one of these discs here is called a thylakoid. And the whole stack of them, okay, is what we call grana. Okay, remember those are inside the stroma, which are enclosed by that inner membrane. It's inside these thylakoids is where the chlorophyll molecule is. And the chlorophyll molecule is going to be super important um, to the photosynthetic process. So the chlorophyll is inside the thylakoids, which are stacked up in grana, um, which, you know, basically if they're stacked up like that, it um, increases the surface area, increases efficiency, and allows the plant to make a whole lot of glucose um, from, you know, the the light that's coming in and the carbon dioxide in the water. So now that we've seen the parts of the plant that um, are going to carry out photosynthesis, let's take a look at the actual photosynthetic process. So here is the overall equation. The reactants in photosynthesis are going to be um, actually the products that we saw in cellular respiration, carbon dioxide and water. And the plant is going to use carbon dioxide and water along with um, energy from the sun in order to make the products glucose and oxygen. Which, if you remember, are the reactants of cellular respiration. So photosynthesis reaction and the cellular respiration reaction are the same reaction, just opposite. Now, if you recall back to cellular respiration, it's basically a process of electron transfer and oxidation reduction reactions where um, electrons are going to be releasing energy in you know, different steps along the way. Now, in photosynthesis, um, we're going to use light to give a boost of energy um, <clears throat> to those electrons uh, so that they can you know, add carbon dioxide molecules together to make sugars. Now, um, carbon dioxide only has carbon and oxygen in it, so where does the hydrogens in the glucose come from? Well, that comes from the water. The chloroplast is going to split the water so that it can give hydrogen ions to the carbon dioxide so it can form sugars. And as a byproduct, um, we're going to get oxygen molecules released. It would be so nice if the chemical reactions for photosynthesis were the exact opposite ones as we saw in cellular respiration. That would make our studying life so much easier, but they're not. Um, we have two stages in photosynthesis rather than three stages in cellular respiration. So let's take a look at photosynthesis. Our two stages are called light reactions okay, and the Calvin cycle. Probably named after a guy named Calvin. Okay, so in the light reactions, we're going to get um, solar energy, or light, okay? Um, that's going to be converted to chemical energy in the form of ATP. We've seen these molecules before. And NADPH. Now, you'll notice that it, um, that molecule has an extra phosphorus compared to the NADH um, that we saw in cellular respiration. Okay, so these two molecules will then, um, you know, enter the Calvin cycle and give energy in order to link the carbon dioxides together and put some hydrogens on there so that in the end we can get sugar. Now if we take a, a little closer look at the light reactions, um, we already know that ATP is an energy molecule, right, and NADPH is um, just like NADH in cellular respiration, it's an electron carrier molecule. So the light is gonna drive the electrons from water to NADP+, okay, that's the oxidized form, to uh, make NADPH, which is the reduced form. And so oxygen is made in the light reactions, but we don't have any sugar yet, okay? So the sugars are not made in light reactions. It's just the splitting of water to create some energy, high energy molecules, um, and the release of oxygen. 
It's in the second stage of photosynthesis called the Calvin cycle in which um, we actually get sugar being made. So that ATP from the light reaction is going to provide the energy for sugar synthesis and the electrons that are being stored in our NADPH molecule is um, going to provide you know, the ability for the reduction of carbon dioxide into glucose. And so um, this Calvin cycle uh, is indirectly dependent on light, right? Because we need those high energy molecules from the light reactions in order to drive the Calvin cycle, but the Calvin cycle does, isn't necessarily um, driven itself by light. So we'll, we'll see um, that some plants actually, you know, during the daytime to kind of, you know, maximize uh, photosynthesis during the daytime, they will um, do a bunch, a bunch, a bunch of, they'll concentrate on light reactions and store all this ATP and NADPH molecules. And then um, when the sun goes down and it's dark, that's when there's Calvin cycle kicks in and uh, they turn all of that energy into sugar. All right, so believe it or not, that was the overview of photosynthesis. And now we get into the gritty details of it. All right, so let's start with the light reactions. Remember, the light reactions are going to convert solar energy to chemical energy. So um, to start off with, what is sunlight? It's a type of energy. We call it electromagnetic, electromagnetic energy or radiation. Right? It travels through space as waves, and the distance between two crests, okay, which are the, the top of the waves, okay, the two crests, that distance between them is um, what we call a wavelength. And so we've got, um, you know, different wavelengths of energy that can uh, move through space. Because there are different wavelengths of energy that run through, um, you know, this electromagnetic radiation, we have a whole kind of spectrum, what we call electromagnetic spectrum of energy from very short gamma rays, right over here, um, to very long radio waves over here. Okay, so um, right there kind of in the middle is a very small part of the spectrum, which we call visible light. So that's uh, what the kind of radiation that our eyes pick up and we are able to see. Okay, but there's a ton of other uh, radiation energy waves that are surrounding us, um, you know, kind of all over radio waves, microwaves, infrared, UV, x-ray, gamma, uh, all kinds of different wavelengths. Now, in visible light, the reason why we see different colors is because um, of the different sizes of wavelengths. So we have, you know, on the purple, the the sh uh, shorter wavelength spectrum, we've got, you know, the purples and the indigos and the blues. And on the longer wavelength spectrum, we have the uh, red, oranges, and yellows. And then, you know, kind of right in the middle is... Uh, yellow and green. So this is kind of cool. Um, we see different colors because there are different pigments in materials. And the different pigments are going to absorb uh, different wavelengths of visible light. And the um, only the way we the color we see is the color that's actually reflected, not absorbed. So plants look green because the blue and violet, wavelengths are absorbed and the red and orange wavelengths um, are absorbed in the pigment but the green greenish yellow are uh, reflected off of um, the pigments in trees and other plants and that's why they you know uh, appear to be green so we can actually uh, basically have that same kind of concept for any color that you see it's uh the color that you see because the pigments in that material are reflecting that color and absorbing every other wavelength of, of light. So in plants, the pigments within the chloroplast are going to absorb the red-orange and the blue-violet wavelengths and reflect you know, the green and yellow like we said before. Um, now, according to the uh, conservation, the law of conservation of energy, energy cannot be created or destroyed. So uh, the energy that the plant absorbs must be changed into another form. Okay. 
Um, and so it, the plant is going to change that solar energy into chemical energy. Within the chloroplast of a plant, there are three main uh, different pigments that are going to absorb different wavelengths of light. Chlorophyll A okay, is one of those pigments that absorbs mainly uh, blue, blue, violet, and red. Um, chlorophyll A is, is the one that actually is directly um, in, participates and in, is involved in the light reactions. And so we'll see that one um, coming up in a little bit when we talk about those reactions. Then we have a second one called chlorophyll B, which absorbs blue and, and orange colors of light, and uh, wavelengths of light, I should say, and reflects uh, yellow-green. And uh, chlorophyll A works closely with chlorophyll B. Whatever energy is absorbed in chlorophyll B will get transferred to chlorophyll A. So the main purpose of chlorophyll B is just kind of be there to broaden the range of um, light that the plant can use. Because remember, chlorophyll A can only um, absorb... These chloroplast pigments, chlorophyll A, chlorophyll B, the carotenoids that we just talked about, are built into the thylakoid membrane, okay, within the chloroplasts. I remember those thylakoids are stacked as grana inside um, the inner membrane of the chloroplast. And within each of those discs, okay, which we call the thylakoid, in that, you know, in the membrane that surrounds it is where all of these pigments are located. And, um, they're part of what we call a light harvesting complex, which is called a photosystem. So all of this is, you know, part of the plant's photosystem. Now these photosystems are going to be responsible for harvesting the light from the sun. And if you take in physics, you know that light can act as both a wave and as a discrete package of energy. Okay, this energy little particle called a photon. So the shorter the wavelength, the greater the energy of this photon. And um, when the pigments, the pigment molecules, absorb photons from the sun, an electron in the actual pigment molecule itself is going to gain a whole bunch of energy. And it's going to go from a ground state of kind of relaxed to a super excited state. If these pigments that we're talking about, these um, photosynthetic pigments, are not coupled to each other inside of a photosystem of a plant, then they would just release that energy that they've absorbed from a photon. They would have to release it again as heat energy um, and as light. And so um, in order to, you know, to get back down to a relaxed, non-excited state. So if we actually isolate chlorophyll, okay, which is one of those pigments, and um, expose it to light, it's going to heat up and it's going to release light as fluorescence, kind of like a little glow stick. Um, however, if we couple chlorophyll molecules um, you know, to each other in these photosystems, we can actually, instead of you know, releasing the energy as heat and light, we can trap, we can capture that energy and put it into chemical energy that can make 
uh, molecules like glucose. So that's why we have to have a whole bunch of chlorophyll molecules inside those thylakoid membranes organized um, with each other in these photosystems that we've been talking about. Okay, so it's a bunch of um, chlorophyll pigments, uh, chlorophyll pigments and carotenoid pigments all kind of bunched together right next to each other in what we call a photosystem. So this cluster of pigment molecules, which includes chlorophyll B, carotenoids, and chlorophyll A, are going to act like a light-gathering antenna. So when the sunlight strikes, photon, a photon strikes that pig, uh, the, you know, one of the pigment molecules, it's going to um, excite it, and an electron is going to be passed from pigment molecule to pigment molecule until it's delivered to the middle of the antenna, Okay, in which there is a chlorophyll A molecule as kind of like the final receptor. So if we look down here in the picture, we've got this photon of light that's going to hit this guy, okay, and, it's, and that electron's going to kind of bounce around until it gets to the middle um, where the chlorophyll A molecule is. Now this chlorophyll A in the center of um, the photosystem is going to then pass the electron to another complex within the, thylo the thylakoid membrane um, to use to make ATP and NADPH. So let's take a look at that in a little bit more detail. So in these light reactions where the photons are hitting the, the pigments and the, uh, the little pigment molecules are transferring electrons over to the chlorophyll, um, then we can have two different things kind of happen. We've got two different photosystems that kind of operate here. We're going to have um, a water splitting photosystem, okay, which is going to use that light energy to extract electrons from water and release oxygen as a byproduct, like we see over here in this one. Okay, so as the light comes down and is passed around those pigments, that energy um, from the electron is going to be used to split water. And the second is a NADPH um, producing photosystem that's going to be making NADPH molecules um, that go to the Calvin cycle to actually, you know, uh, con you know bring carbon dioxide together in order to make uh, glucose and sugar molecules. Not that it's complicated enough, but between the two systems, between the water splitting and the NADPH um, photosystems within the thylakoid membrane is a electron transport chain, which is going to be responsible for making the ATP. Okay, so we kind of have this big um, kind of chain here with uh, different molecule, different energy molecules being made um, at different points within this uh, photosystem. So the electrons kind of travel through these two photosystems like this picture here. So let's kind of walk through this. So to start off with, we need a photon of light. Okay, so we get a photon of light that's going to hit the pigments and energize uh, one of the pigment molecules. Okay, it's going to um, you know, basically shoot off an electron from a pigment molecule with high amounts of energy um, that is going to split water. Okay, so the first thing it does is split water. All right, so this guy up here is going to split water, and then he's going to pass this high energy electron through the ETC, the electron transport chain, which right here is called the ATP mill. So it goes down through um, the electron transport chain to make some ATP, and then it gets to the second photosystem, which is the NADPH producing one. Well, guess what? We need another photon of light to give it some more energy, okay? Because it's not, you know, all the way down to, to low, but it's losing energy it goes, as it goes through uh, the electron transport chain. So we need another photon of light to give it even more energy so that um, it can go up, you know, through this second photosystem in which it's then transferred to an NADP molecule to make NADPH. So in kind of, you know, one little process here, we can split water, make ATP, and make NADPH within the same kind of photosystem. So this is all kind of lined up um, together 
throughout the thylakoid membranes. If we take a look at that same system that we were just talking about um, linearly in, you know, what it would look like inside of a thylakoid membrane, it kind of looks like this. Okay, so we've got um, photosystem one here and photosystem two. Okay, and um, the light is going to um, energize photosystem one so that we can break water, okay, and release the oxygen. Okay, so oxygen's released, and that high energy electron is um, is going to go through that electron transport chain. Okay, in the meantime, that electron remember that electron electron transport chain, um, hope or thankfully works just like the one in cellular respiration, where it's going to use the energy of the electrons um, in order to pull hydrogens from one side of the, the membrane to the other side of the membrane. Okay, so just like we saw in cellular respiration. So as um, these electrons go through the electron transport chain proteins, it's gonna suck hydrogens from the stroma into the uh, inside of the thylakoid. And um, once those electron chains get down into photosystem number two, again, we need a second photon of light to come and energize it one more time, energize that electron one more time so that it can um, make a molecule or it can uh, reduce a molecule of ADP into ADPH. Okay, and so that ADPH we'll see will go to the Calvin cycle um, in order to make glucose. Now in the meantime, to make ATP, this electron chain, remember, is taking those hydrogens from the stroma into the thylakoid um, itself, and that's going to make a high concentration of uh, hydrogens inside the thylakoid, which, remember, have potential energy themselves. And so, um, like in cellular respiration, they cannot escape except through an ATP synthase uh, protein here, okay? So as they um, go from high concentration to low concentration out this ATP synthase, we get ATP that is made as well. So just like cellular respiration, it's highly complex, um, but luckily you don't have to know every single little protein that's involved. You just kind of need to know the gist of you know how it works and what's made where. All right. Enough of the light reactions, let's take a look at the Calvin cycle, or what some people call the dark reactions, since they can, they can occur in the dark, although they need the uh, ATP and NADPH from the light reactions. Okay, so in the Calvin cycle, it's basically like a big sugar factory within the chloroplast. Um, the inputs that we need are carbon dioxide and ATP, and NADPH. So those are the, the main things that we are going to need in order um, for the Cal Calvin cycle to work. Now the carbon dioxide, remember, it comes in through the stroma of the leaf um, from the air. Now the ATP and the NADPH we need from the light reactions. So although the Calvin cycle can work in the dark, we definitely need the light reactions um, in order for the Calvin cycle to work. All right, so here are the details. The Calvin cycle is going to use carbon dioxide, okay, to and ATP and NADPH to make a three-carbon sugar, right here, called G3P. And G G3P can be used to make glucose and other compounds, okay, so like cellulose and starch. Um, it can even be used in cellular respiration to give, in the mitochondria of the plant cell, to give the cell energy to even make, do photosynthesis. Okay, so that's kind of the inputs. We've got carbon dioxide, input and output. We have carbon dioxide, ATP, and NADPH, okay, that come together to make a three-carbon sugar called G3P, and that can be used to make glucose or other compounds. So if we look at this cycle in a little bit more detail, we can make one molecule of G3P for every three 
molecules of carbon dioxide. Okay, so we need three carbon dioxides to make one G3P. Okay, so what happens is that um, now, now we're going to take a look at, you know, kind of one carbon dioxide at a time. Okay, so carbon from carbon dioxide is connected to a 5-carbon ribulose bisphosphate. Okay, so that one is right here. Okay, this is uh, RUBP. Okay, short for ribulose uh, biphosphate. Okay, so this 5-carbon ribulose biphosphate is this molecule right there. So we get another carbon added to this to make a 6-carbon molecule. Okay, because if we have five carbons here and one from carbon dioxide, um, then we get a six carbon molecule. Okay, so this, although this picture shows three carbon dioxides coming in and what it all makes, um, we're just going to take a look at one carbon dioxide at a time. So the one carbon dioxide hooks up to the uh, ribulose bis bisphosphate and makes a six carbon molecule. Now the six carbon molecule is then broken down into two three carbon molecules. Okay, so for every one carbon dioxide, um, right now, so right now we're talking about one carbon dioxide coming in and um, hooking up with a ribulose bisphosphate, okay, to make a six carbon um, molecule which is broken down into two three carbon molecules. Okay, so there's two of those that are made. Now, um, ATP and NADPH okay, are then used to change the structure of that three carbon, um, uh, what's called three PGA. Don't you love these names? Because you're going to have to know them, so just work with it. Okay, um, so the the three carbon molecule is three PGA, okay, um, in which the ATP and the NADPH rearrange that in order to make G3P, okay, that one that we had talked about before, okay, so G3P. So as this cycle turns, one G3P is spit out to make glucose and stuff, and then the other ones are used to put the uh, ribulose bisphosphate back together again so that the cycle can keep going. So, um, you know, it's, it's kind of confusing, but if you realize that a carbon dioxide hooks up with a 5-carbon sugar ribulose bisphosphate to make a 6-carbon molecule that, the, that is then immediately broken into a 3-carbon molecule called 3-PGA, the ATP and the NADPH rearrange to make G3P, then you're kind of good to go. See, and then the rest of the cycle is just used to regenerate the uh, ribulose bisphosphate again. Okay, so in reality, we need three carbon dioxide molecules, okay, that will make six, right, that are going to hook up with three. Um, ribulose bisphosphate molecules to make six 3PGA molecules. And then we're going to need an ATP for each and an NADPH for each to make six G3P molecules. Out of those six, one of them is spit out to make glucose, and the other five get rearranged into more ribulose bisphosphate. <sighs> Fun, huh? All right, let's move on. Okay, so we finished our details about the photosynthetic process and all the chemical reactions that take place. Now we're going to finish up um, talking about some special kinds of plants, C4 plants and CAM plants. These plants are usually found in dry, arid conditions um, in which water loss you know, is um, you know, very imminent, and so they need to conserve water in kind of a special way. So this is, you know, kind of how they work. They're going to do all of their gas exchange at night when it's nice and cool. Because when um, carbon dioxide, you know, goes in through the stomata, 
those little tiny holes in the bottom of the leaf, and the oxygen is going out of the stomata, there's always a possibility of water also going out. And that possibility is higher if it's you know really dry and hot. Okay, So what the plants will do is they will do all of their gas exchange at night when it's nice and cool, and then they're going to close their stomata during the day in order to uh, not lose any water through the stomata during the day when it's hot. Okay, so this is kind of how they do it. The C4 plants, okay, at night are going to um, take in all of their carbon dioxide and they're going to combine it with a four carbon molecule. That's why they call them C4. So they're going to combine their carbon dioxide with a four carbon molecule that kind of holds the carbon dioxide in the plant until it's ready to be used. So the plant builds up this store of carbon dioxide at night and then when it starts to get hot they're going to close their stomata and they're going to then shuttle all of their carbon dioxide into the Calvin cycle um, during the day. So uh, they're going so they're going to be uh, you know that's kind of how they conserve water in in one way. Now the cam plants is similar. Okay, it's a similar process, but instead of a four carbon um, you know molecule to trap the the carbon dioxide, it's a three carbon shuttle molecule. Okay. Um, that again happens at night, okay, and then during the day they release that, or the, the, the little three carbon shuttle molecule is going to release the carbon dioxide into the Calvin cycle so that that process can happen during the day. Okay, so to end, end this lecture with just a brief one more summary, one more cycle through photosynthesis. So in the light reactions, they're going to produce ATP, NADPH, and oxygen, right, um, as water is being split. Splitting of water is going to replace the electrons that are excited by photons within um, the photosystem, you know, pigments and carotenoids um, that are happening in the light reactions. Now in the Calvin cycle, carbon dioxide from the air is converted to the three carbon molecule, three PGA, and then we get then then we use our ATP and our NADPH to convert 3PGA into a G3P molecule that's used to make glucose. <sighs> okay, we're done. A lot of detail, just like cellular respiration. So you're gonna have to go through this step by step, detail by detail, because you will need to know that you know know the process for uh, you know the midterm and the final. So make sure you you know. Draw out pictures, draw out the steps, walk through it, talk through it, okay, um, just to kind of get it in your head. And we'll see you in class.